welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovac, and I'm pleased to be here. Omar el Akkad is the author of American War, a poignant novel that imagines a future civil war born from the U.S.'s current destructive policies and impulses. It was an international bestseller, translated into 13 languages, and named one of the best books of the year by the New York Times and NPR, among many other places. In a New York Times review of his brand new book, What Strange Paradise, journalist and author Wendell Stevenson says, the story so astutely unpacks the us versus them dynamics of our divided world that it deserves to be an instant classic. I haven't loved a book this much in a long time. This evening, he will be joined in conversation with broadcaster and journalist, Tracy Matisak. Thank you so much for being here. And now Tracy and Omar, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Laura. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for sharing a portion of your Thursday evening with us. We are honored and delighted to have Omar el Akkad with us this evening to talk about this exquisite book, What Strange Paradise. So that said, Omar, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tracy, for doing this. It, it really means a lot, and it's just an absolute privilege to be here with you. Well, I am delighted and excited to dig into the book. And because it is a work of fiction, um, we talked earlier and we decided that it would be a great idea if you could read a little bit of the beginning of the book for us and kind of set the, the scene for us and then we'll we'll go from there. How's that sound? Absolutely sounds great. Okay. I, um, I went to the store today and did the insufferable author thing and bought a copy of my own book because I <laughs> of course run out of the, <laughs> the author copies. <laughs> um, and then signed a bunch of their stock. There's this myth that authors have that if you sign the stock, then they can't send it back to the publisher. They have to. Ah. They have to yeah. It's entirely untrue, but we like to believe it. So, <laughs> um, so this is uh, this is from the very beginning. Um, I don't think I need to tell you much more than that. The child lies on the shore. All around him, the beach is littered with the wreckage of the boat and the wreckage of its passengers. Shards of decking knapsacks cleaved and gutted, bodies frozen in unnatural contortion. Dispossessed of nightfall's temporary burial, the dead ferment indecency. There's too much of spring in the day, too much light. Face down with his arms outstretched, the child appears from a distance as though playing at flight. And so too in the bodies that surround him, though distended with seawater and hardening, there flicker the remnants of some silent levitation a severance from the laws of being. The sea is tranquil now, the storm has passed. The island, despite the debris, is calm. A pair of plump orange-necked birds, stragglers from a northbound flock, take rest on the lamppost from which hangs one end of a police cordon. In the breaks between the wailing of the sirens and the murmur of the onlookers, they can be heard singing. The species is not unique to the island, nor the island to the species. But the birds, when they stop here, change the pitch of their songs. The call is an octave higher, a sharp, throat-scraping thing. In time, a crowd gathers near the site of the shipwreck, tourists and locals alike. People watch. The eldest of them, an arthritic fisherman driven in recent years by plummeting cherub fish stocks to kitchen work at a nearby resort, says that it has never been like this before on the island. Other lo locals nod because even though the history of this place is that of violent endings, of galleys flipped over the axis of their oars and fishing skiffs tangled in their own netting, and once during the war an empty Higgins lander sheared to ribbons by shrapnel, the old man is still in his own way right. These are foreign dead. No one can remember exactly when they first started washing up along the eastern coast, but in the last year it has happened with such frequency that many of the nations on whose tourists the island's economy depends have issued travel advisories. The hotels and resorts in turn have offered discounts. Between them, the Coast Guard and the morgue keep a partial count of the dead. And as of this morning, it stands at 1,026, but this number is as much an abstraction as the dead themselves are to the people who live here, to whom all the shipwrecks of the previous year are a single shipwreck, all the bodies, a single body. <laughs> 
three officers from the municipal police force pull a long strip of caution tape along the breadth of the walkway that leads from the road to the beach. Another three wrestle with large sheets of blue boat cover canvas, trying to build a curtain between the dead and their audience. In this way, the destruction takes on an air of queer unreality, a stage play bled of movement, a fairy tale upturned. The officers, all of them young and impatient, manage to tether the fabric to a couple of lampposts from which the orange necked birds whistle and flee. But even stretched to near tearing, the canvas does little to hide the dead from view. Some of the onlookers shuffle awkwardly to the far end of the parking lot where there's still an acute line of sight between the draping and four television news trucks. Others climb on top of parked cars and sweep their cameras across the width of the beach. Some with their backs to the carnage, their own faces occupying the center of the recording. The dead become the property of the living. Oriented as they are, many of the shipwrecked bodies appear to have been spat up landward by the sea or of their own volition to have walked out from its depths and then collapsed a few feet later, except the child. Relative to the others, he is inverted, his head closest to the lapping waves, his feet nestled into the warmer, lighter sand that remains dry even at highest tide. He is small, but somewhere along the length of his body marks the sea's furthest reach. A wave brushes gently against the child's hair. He opens his eyes. Thank you so much, Omar, for setting the stage for us uh, with the beginning of the book. And that little boy, of course, is Amir, who is the protagonist of the book and the adventure begins from there. Um, but as I was reading the book for myself and I was just sort of imagining all of that in my mind, I could not help but think about the little Syrian boy whose body washed ashore some years ago, um, Alan Curdy, I believe his name was, and, and his photograph really awakened the world to the refugee crisis that was happening. And I wondered if that incident and that photo in any way sort of planted the seed in your mind uh, for this book. I had, I had started thinking about the, 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 the original sort of seeds of, of what would become this book actually predate that. Um, I was, um, I mean, that, that image is seared in my head um, and will be forever. Um, uh, a long time ago, I was, I was in Egypt. Uh, I was born in Egypt and I, I spent the first five years of my life there and I, the next 11 in the Middle East generally, but uh, I'm Egyptian by birth and, and heritage. And um, I was back there as a journalist many years later. Um, and I was driving around one night with an old high school friend who was complaining about the most universal thing there is. Uh, the rents were too high. He was complaining about the rents. And I said, well, what's, what's the price of an apartment in your building, for example? And he said, well, do you mean the locals price or the Syrians price? I said, well, what the hell's the Syrians price? And he said, well, we've had an influx recently of these folks showing up from Syria and uh, they don't have any leverage, they have no choice. So they pay three times as much. And it became clear that this wasn't just a rent thing. This was when you went down to buy vegetables from the stall down the street, it was the same setup. What choice do you have? You're a refugee here, you, you know, what are you gonna not, not eat? Yeah. Um, and, it, and this is in the context of, of you know, all the Arab leaders standing up and saying uh, our Syrian brothers and sisters, our Syrian brothers and sisters, the same way for decades they've been saying our Palestinian brothers and sisters and so on and so forth. On the reality, you know, the reality on the ground was that that was nonsense. At the end of the day, there was a population that could be exploited. And so it was going to be exploited. Yeah. Um, that's the earliest memory I have of, of that sort of jump started the things I started thinking about that led to this book. Certainly that image well, and I, and I still have a hard time talking about it, but, but mm -hmm. it wasn't just the image. It was the fact that the entirety of the world became so outraged for about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being flippant, but, but for a very limited amount of time. And then we all moved on. Yeah. The same way that further on when I was getting very close to the end of this, there was that image of a man and his daughter trying to get into this country and they had been swimming and they drowned and they washed up. Mm -hmm. And there was an image and it was in the Washington Post and it provoked so much outrage for about 24 hours. And then we all moved on to the next scandal. And, and that, I think, the privilege of instantaneous forgetting, the idea that you can look away without any consequence, I think inspired this book more, more than anything else. 
And we see that played out over and over again in the book, Omar, for instance, just when um, Amir washes up on that beach, it's a beach that is also inhabited by vacationers who are looking at these bodies and thinking, this is getting in the way of my day at the beach. Yeah, there's there's uh, there's a sort of Great Gatsby party that's happening with you know in in the immediate vicinity of this horrific event where this boat has capsized. And there's these bodies on the shore. I I have a very strange relationship with with my characters generally, which I almost certainly should be taking up with my therapist rather than talking about in this interview. But I, I the most honest characters in in all my books are the villains um, because they at least are honest with themselves. So there's you know, a lot of the story is, is essentially a repurposed fable. A lot of what Strange Paradise is just the story of Peter Pan reinterpreted as the tale of a contemporary child refugee. And so my Captain Hook character is this guy named Colonel Kethros, who, who is the soldier who's carrying a ton of trauma from previous wars, physical and emotional. And he's obsessed with chasing down this kid and, and, and sort of getting things right, putting decorum back, you know, on the island. And at one point he says, you know, he says to this child, I'm the only one who genuinely cares about you mm -hmm. uh, because I'm gonna continue caring about you tomorrow. Whereas all these people who stand up for you are gonna sort of move on. Uh, and so this is a man who's very honest with himself about his xenophobia, his racism, his sense of us versus them. Um, and even, even like the other villains in the book, he lies to everyone else. He's, he's perfectly honest with himself because he understands, he doesn't have to tell himself that the situation is any different from what he believes it to be. Yeah. So the the Syrian refugee crisis is is certainly the biggest one uh, that we're aware of, but by no means the only one. You know, you think about the Sudan, you think about Myanmar, um, Afghanistan, uh, Central America. Um, we have refugee crises all over the world, and and your book really highlights the reactions. And we we just talked about you know the the vacationers on the beach, but you know the the reactions to these refugees ranging from you know sympathy to irritation to flat out hostility toward them. And I'm curious about uh, why you chose to use fiction to kind of hold a mirror to us, to force us to look at the way that we think about and look at one another. That's a, that's a really fascinating question. I, I, a lot of my favorite authors, um, I'm thinking of James Baldwin, I'm thinking of Nagib Mahfouz, I'm thinking of, um, Leanne Beto Samasaki Simpson, who, who, who works up in, in Canada and is horribly underrated. But anyway, they have, they have this talent for alchemy, essentially, taking anger and, and transforming it into something profound. I don't have that talent. And there's in all my works, all my works, my, my two novels and my short stories, uh, you can see the places where it got away from me, where I wasn't able to transform that anger. But, but generally speaking, I write from that place. Mm. And so, you know, I was, I am one of those people who doesn't have a very good answer to the question, where are you from? You know, I was born in one place. I grew up in another. I'm a citizen of a third country. Now I live in a fourth. And so for people like me, generally, I think fiction storytelling in general feels like home because you can take the contours of this invented world and move it around to fit whatever your experience is. So I'm, I've been drawn to, to fiction from a very, very young age. Um, also, a lot of the stories that I write are, by their nature, very dismissive of the idea of the nation state. Um, if you pick up American War, my first novel, the first thing you see is a map in which I've moved the borders of the U.S. around and buried places underwater. And, you know, I, I, I don't have any respect for the inherent sanctity of the nation state. That's just a lot of people will disagree with that and, and reflexively disagree with that. And, and they may be right and I may be wrong. But from my particular upbringing, that's where I write. And so fiction just feels like home to do this. You can, you can build it out to fit exactly the world that you want. And then if you do it properly, it functions a little bit like both the lighthouse and the storm. You can take somebody to a very uncomfortable place, but also shed some light on something. Um, do I do it properly all of the time or even some of the time? I don't know, but <clears throat> that's, that's sort of what I'm, what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So Amir, once he sort of gathers himself and he runs away from these uh, sort of rescue workers, if you will, on the beach who are picking over 
these bodies and he runs into a 15 year old girl or he's spotted by a 15 year old girl who lives on the island who could not be any different than Amir is. And the story continues to unfold um, largely through the eyes of these two children, a 15 year old girl and eight year old Amir. And um, I'd love for you to talk about the use of children and telling the story through the eyes of children who are navigating like so many refugee children are and so many children around the world, a very dangerous, difficult, scary place. Yeah, I, 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 I went, I, I was asked recently about, you know, why, why children at the beginning of the American War and why children in what strange paradise. And I went back and looked to see if this was a trend and sure enough, and almost, I, I wrote three thoroughly unpublishable novels before American War. So I went back and looked at those and sure enough, you know, um, I, I think uh, I think it's because I'm of the opinion that childhood is is the time of our only really honest interaction with the world um, before we develop the conceits of adulthood and before I mean we all live under capitalism we all are required to do things and be doing things and and there's an entire rule set of behavior that comes along with that mm -hmm. and in the time before that becomes accepted and the time before that works its way into a person's marrow, I think is, is for me the clearest prism through which to pass a story. Mm. Um, and I, you know, again, I, I write about stuff that I think is wrong with the world for, you know, it's, it, to be simplistic about it. And, and juxtaposing that against the honesty of a childhood experience seems to be the, the, the sharpest way for me to, to show clearly how broken something is that we've all accepted as okay. Yeah. Before we get into uh, some of the real life events that are sort of interwoven here, um, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the other characters in the book because, you know, Amir becomes something of a stowaway on this fishing boat uh, that's headed from Egypt to the island of Kaz, and he's following his, his uncle slash stepfather who has no idea that he's getting on the boat. Um, but there is such a fascinating cast of characters on that boat and we get glimpses of, you know, the human condition and human nature um, through some of the dialogues there. Um, there was one dialogue in particular that stood out to me and there, it was a commentary on the United States. And so these passengers on the boat are going back and forth about, oh, you know, Americans are, you know, comfortable with sex. No, they're not comfortable with sex, they're comfortable with violence. And I thought that was so interesting. And I'd love for you to just talk about that and those kinds of exchanges where we get another view of sort of that other ism that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, in almost everything I've written, I, I very rarely agree with anything my characters have to say. I disagree. <laughs> it's almost a blanket disagreement with, with almost everything anyone in my character. Some things I disagree with a little less than others. Um, I, uh, I was born in Egypt, but I grew up in this place called Qatar, which is a tiny peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. And uh, in the mid eighties, my father couldn't find work in Egypt. The political situation was a mess. He ended up in Qatar, which was on its way to becoming what it is now, which is pound for pound, the richest country on earth. Mm. And um, <clears throat> it, when I was living there, uh, the first Gulf War ro rolled around and um, the US built a military base in Qatar. And we had grown up in Qatar. Qatar had no local cultural industries. They, they didn't exist. There wasn't a library when I was there. There was very little production of anything cultural. It's, it's a Bedouin culture, so it, it naturally moves around. And also there was so much oil wealth that it was, it was burying all of that. Anyway, we grew up on an imported American culture. There was one, there was one TV station, uh, English TV station. I remember it played incessantly, it played two shows, it played MacGyver and America's Most Wanted, which, which when you're a kid gives you a very sort of warped <laughs> version of what this country's like. Anyway, you know, music, I still have, there, it's around here somewhere, my, my copy of uh, two Nirvana albums, uh, Nevermind and In Utro, and everything that came into the country had to pass through the censor, the government censor. So my copy of um, Nevermind, the baby on that cover is censored out because the baby's naked in that cover. Mm -hmm. It's just a black marker and a <laughs> baby's face. In utero, there's an angel on that cover that's not wearing any clothes. That, that's, that's also blacked out. <laughs> you, you associate at a very early age the consumption of any art with rebellion. Mm 
you know, holding up these things to the light, holding up copies of Newsweek to the light to try and see what was what the guy the, in the censor's office thought yeah. was too dangerous for you. Anyway, long story short, you think you understand America. Mm. I mean, I sound the way I do for a reason, right? I, I went to American schools. I, and uh, then I moved here much later in life. And every morning I wake up and realize I have no idea how America works. Um, every day I'm faced with something that obliterates the certainty I had as a child about this country. And so this is a, my very roundabout way of talking about these people on the boat who, you know, I pull traits from people that I know. I don't, I don't take whole characters. I don't take, you know, my friend Jim and put him in the, in the boat. And, but I do take traits. And one of those traits was one of my own, which is this idea of like, oh, I know what the West is like mm -hmm. from a great distance. And then here's one of the characters who happens to be the villain, you know, the smuggler's apprentice on the boat saying, mm -hmm. you have no idea. You, have, you, you haven't been there. You have this fantasy of what the West is. Brace yourself. Yeah. The other um, conversation that really struck me was when they were talking about how, you know, some people are engines and some people are fuel and you can try to change yourself any way you want, but at the end of the day, you're still going to be the fuel. Yeah, that's another one where I think I disagree, but I'm not certain. I'm not certain I disagree with this character. Um, I, I, I think of the novel, I think of What Strange Paradise in particular as, as a novel about the collision of, of dueling fantasies. So, you know, the, on one side, you have the fantasy of folks who come from my part of the world, uh, a lot of whom believe that the West is nirvana. The West is a cure for all ills, and if I can just get there, and certainly to, to a certain extent, there's an element of that, right? I mean, as much as I continuously criticize this country that I now live in, uh, I do so without fear of the secret police coming and dragging me to, to an underground prison, right? Which is what would happen in Egypt if I was still in Egypt and made the same kind of criticisms in print, in interviews, there's a good chance I wouldn't be around anymore. So, so there's an element to it, but, but uh, this notion that you come here and everything is okay is a fantasy. And inevitably it collides with the fantasy headed in the other direction of folks from this part of the world many of whom believe that all of these people coming here are barbarians at the gate. And we need to stop them at any cost, even if it means burning the whole place down just so they don't get their hands on it. So this, a lot of what's happening in the, you know, the structure of the book is before chapters and after chapters. They're, they're chapters that take place after the boy washes up on the island and chapters that show how he got there in the first place. And in a way you just have, it's basically just a collision of dueling fantasies. Um, reality is subservient to both. What, what, what the world is actually like is of no importance to folks on either side of, of yeah. this particular collision. Yeah, we're seeing that for sure. Um, Omar, I wanna talk a little bit about, as I mentioned, the real life events that are sort of weaved into the story or at least hinted at in the story. And certainly um, in thinking about the Syrian civil war because it, it, it puts it you know, front and center um, in our minds as we're reading the book, it's been going on for I think 10 plus years now, um, something like 13 and a half million people have been displaced either within the country or outside of the country. Um, remind us how all of that started um, and, and what the conditions are that caused so many people to flee. And I'm asking you to kind of put your journalist hat on for this one. Um. I, I apologize in advance for oversimplifying everything I'm about to say, but it started with two things. It started generally with a uh, fruit and vegetable vendor who set himself on fire, a guy named Boazizi, uh, who was being hassled by the cops, um, Tunisian guy who was being hassled by the cops and got to a point of su such dejection at his prospects for any kind of decent life that he set himself on fire, killed himself. And, um, that was the precipitating event of the protest that would end up becoming the Arab Spring. Uh, it spread from there, it spread into Egypt. We toppled the guy who'd been running the country for the entirety of my life. Um, you know, I'm a 39 year old man. There's wow. been one guy um, running the country and we, you know, people lost their lives. And so it was, it was a full on revolution. Um, and it spread to other places where it failed miserably. It spread very briefly into Bahrain, this tiny country where the, the crackdown was instantaneous. Um, 
and as I'm saying this, so there's little details in the novel. For example, there's a detail in the novel where um, they're driving, the family, Amir's family is driving past uh, a billboard that um, shows the face of the president and congratulates him on his win in the elections that haven't happened yet. Um, so this is sort of congratulations in advance. Um, that's a real thing that happened in Egypt. I remember as a kid driving around and, you know, congratulations, Mr. President. And it's this incredibly flattering depiction of the president who does not look like that in the slightest. And, but the biggest text on the billboard is the name of the businessman who paid for it because this try wow. this guy's trying to curry favor so what he's really saying is like please when i come looking for permits remember that i paid for the sign yeah. so that stuff worked its way into the novel um specifically in the case of syria it started with graffiti it started with the, the arab spring and that spirit of the arab spring worked its way into syria and these kids tagged a wall uh with with a slogan against the president or against the government it's the same thing effectively but uh, and then they were snatched up, people protested, they were killed, everything blew up from there. Um, so it starts with these very minor instances and then within you know, months you have possibly, I believe the largest refugee crisis since World War II. And, and we look at it in the context of how many of these people ended up in Europe, because I get it, Europe is important and rich and full of Westerners, but you look at Lebanon, it mm -hmm. took in way more refugees and it is not as rich as anywhere in Western Europe, right? Um, the real refugee crisis was happening in the immediate borders. Those countries were taking on massive numbers, but a few people on boats tried to, to flee to Europe and, th and that is thought of as the refugee crisis or the migrant crisis. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller part of it. Yeah. I want to remind our viewers that if you've got a question for Omar, whether it's about the book or about any of the events that he has covered or the uh, the events that we see in the book, by all means, uh, you should go to the bottom of your screen there. You'll see a Q&A icon and you can click on that and enter your question there. We've budgeted some time for your questions toward the end of our conversation. So I do want to encourage you to do that. Um, Omar, before we move off the subject of Syria specifically, um, you know, uh, the Syrian president, um, al-Assad, has been brutally murdering his people there for so long. And we see the stories. There was something just on 60 Minutes, maybe two weeks ago, I think, about you know these bodies bearing the marks that, that provide evidence um, that he was responsible. Will he ever be held accountable? Where, where do you envision all of this going? I think one of the most terrifying things for me is that I mean, obviously my opinion on, you know, who, who cares what I think, but, but, but I can't even fathom what being held to account looks like for, for a crime of that magnitude. One of the really fascinating things about the Al-Assad family, um, who, who come from a specific ethnic minority within, within the country, um, is that, uh, so, so we, have, we have the current Al-Assad, his brother, um, and then their father was the previous president, um, Hafez al-Assad, you go back and you find that al-Assad wasn't really their last name. Uh, Al-Assad in Arabic means the lion. And it was, I believe, the current president's grandfather who, who, who adopted that last name to sound tougher. Mm -hmm. And it happened in the context of French colonialism of, of repeated attempts to push out the, the colonizers that the locals would, would establish their own government, their own way of trying to run things. The, the colonizers would sabotage it. And the lesson the locals would take is, we need to be meaner, we need to be tougher. Mm -hmm. And this happened generation after generation. And eventually that's the context from which the al family comes out of, where the one lesson you've learned is you have to be as brutal as humanly possible to make this enterprise work. Well, eventually you do get rid of the colonizers. What you don't get rid of is that mindset. And now there's no foreigner to inflict it on. Now you're inflicting it on your own people. Um, yeah. And so will he personally be held to account? I doubt it. Um, but I'm even more pessimistic about whether this entire system will be held to account. That's a really hard thing to, to dismantle. Yeah. You, um, you had experience, of course, covering the Arrow Spring that you just described for us. Uh, you were in Egypt, I believe, which uh, you said you were born there. What was that experience like for you, being there as a journalist, covering that, seeing all of that unfold? What 
struck you the most about that experience? Um, so I, there, there, was, there, was, there was some things that in, in the moment that struck me and there was one thing in hindsight um, years later that, I, that I'll, I'll talk about as well. But um, in the moment, I think the thing that struck me is that, you know, you look, you look at a dictatorship, any dictatorship, and I grew up in a part of the world that's almost entirely dictatorships by different names, monarchies, whatever, royal families, whatever you want to call them. But it's, it's plainly evident how ruinous a system of governance this is. You don't need some abstract paper about it. You can look at the street level. You can see the, the, the sort of desperate poverty, the, the, the anti-meritocracy right? The, the billionaire son is going to become the next head of the company. It's not, you know, which again, it's not, it's not an Arab phenomenon. Like I can point, I can point up plenty of cases uh, in this part of the world where that's good. Everyone knows the system doesn't work. But when I would talk to members of my own family, when I would talk to my friends, when I would talk to strangers, one of the things that was more, even more terrifying to them than this system was the idea of chaos. You know, Egypt is a very stratified place. You know, you, if you park your car anywhere on the street in Egypt, there's this guy who's going to run out. The job title is Minedi, um, guy who waves. And what that means is there's going to be a guy who's going to stand in your rear view and be like, back up, back up. You still got space. You still got space. It's a fully understood informal occupation in Egypt, right? And what you're supposed to do when you get out of the car is you give this guy like a buck or two, right? It's fully understood societal norm. And one of the things that terrified people it's particularly the upper middle class in Egypt, the, the actual middle class is being thinned away, but, but like the sort of the upper crust of Egyptian society was following the revolution. This guy didn't, didn't feel the need to be as differential to you. You know, maybe he doesn't call you sir or ma'am anymore. Yeah. And that was a no-go. They, they would take anything, bring the dictator back, bring the military back. I will not put up with it. And so that was the thing that struck me the most in the moment. Yeah, was just how ingrained the sense of I need this class system. I know it by heart. I know my place in it. You can't take that away from me. I don't yeah. care if it's democracy. No, right. So and, and eventually that's what happened. Just the whole thing yeah. fell apart under the weight of that. In hindsight, the thing that struck me the most was I was a journalist for ten years, and I, I was only tear gassed twice. I was tear gassed when I was covering the Arab Spring in Cairo, and when I was covering the Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson, Missouri. Wow. And that's not to say that being in one of those places somehow gives you a heightened understanding of the other, but it, the, the, the language, the atmospheric language was very similar. This heavily militarized police presence, people who were so full of, fed up with the, the system as it was that they were willing to stand up to this heavily militarized police presence. That language and, and the sort of seeming universality of it is what struck me in the aftermath. Those were, those were two very different stories in two very different places and they felt a little bit the same. Yeah. It's fascinating, and it leads me to my next question, which is that, of course, there is increasing fear here in the United States that democracy is in danger here. Um, you wrote an opinion piece in the Globe and Mail, and it was um, about the January 6th insurrection. Um, I'd love if you would share some of your, your thoughts about that and, and your view of whether democracy as we have known it here in the United States truly is in danger. Again, I mean, I, I, I am a person who makes things up for a living. So please take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt. I, uh, my last few years as a journalist, I was, I was a US-based foreign correspondent. I was covering America for a non-American audience. And um, that entails certain things. One of those things is M copy, those, those paragraphs that you put into a, a, an article that explain the background of something. Mm -hmm. And so when I was writing, stories about gun violence, healthcare, um, politics, gerrymandering, the way the political system works here, the way the Senate works. So I would have to include these paragraphs for a non-American audience that basically boiled down to, no, no, this is really how it works here. Mm. Because it's so, it is so alien to somebody who didn't grow up in it. Like this yeah. idea that you have to choose between, you know, you get sick, okay, now choose between a literal or a financial death sentence. Like mm -hmm. that, that notion itself, it, it has to be explained to somebody who's not from here. That's yeah. just doesn't compute. Not a thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's sort of the prism that I that I look at this country through. Um, 
I think one of the, again, I, I don't know what the political leanings of our audience is tonight. I, I apologize in advance, but, but in my mind, I don't think there is a right-leaning party and a left-leaning party in this country. I think there is a center-right party and something that's becoming a deranged cult. Um, and it used to be the case, I think, that if you believe the things that the Republican Party now considers part of their mainstream core beliefs, previously, you were your neighborhood of people you could find who, who believe similar things was very small, and that limited the amount of damage you could do. Yeah. Well, along comes Fox News, and more recently, along comes social media, and suddenly that neighborhood, now you've got, you don't have to leave your neighborhood ever. Yeah. You've got the entire infrastructure around you. And that to me is the most dangerous thing. Um, Donald Trump was never gonna be the last Donald Trump, I don't think. I think the folks who are waiting in the wings are worse because they're not as cartoonishly sort of, they're not as buffoonish, right? Um, and, and so my sense of what scares me the most when I think about fundamentally America's ability to do things on a large scale is this idea that if you believe these things that I, I consider patently deranged, you now have an entire neighborhood catering to your every whim. Um, and that's terrifying to me. I don't know yeah. how you fix that. Yeah. Speaking of terrifying, uh, at least one more question before we get to our audience questions. And, and that is that um, you're joining us from Portland. Uh, that was uh, one of the, you know, sites that everybody was watching uh, around this time last year with the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests that were unfolding across the country. And Portland was unique in the sense that we were seeing people being, you know, whisked away in these vans by these sort of nameless, faceless um, kinds of troops. Um, you were there. What did you make of what you saw that and uh, what you saw there? And do you think that a year later, have those protests changed anything? So Portland is a, is a strange place in the sense that it has this very progressive veneer. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive. There are people here who are fundamentally sort of, you know, very much not just all talk in, in, their, in their outlook. They, they go out and they do the work. But you also have, you know, entire neighborhoods in which uh, every other house has a Black Lives Matter sign on the front lawn. There's not a single Black family in the neighborhood, you know. And this isn't an accident. Uh, Highway 5, when it was built through the city, was deliberately built through the Black neighborhoods to displace those neighborhoods. That's not, that's not an accident. You know, that's, that's a, a feature, not a bug. Um, and so you have this kind of collision of, of the, the what, what, what progressive current day Portland wants and the history with which it has to deal. And also the fact that, um, you know, we were, we couldn't, we, we wanted to buy a house here and we couldn't afford anything in Portland proper. So we started looking in the outskirts and there were two different neighborhoods on the outskirts of Portland that got an automatic veto because one of the neighbors was flying a Confederate flag. Um, you know, we're 3000 miles away from the nearest battle site. Um, it's, it's that kind of thing, which I don't, I, don't, I don't think is particularly unique to, to Oregon. I think many parts of America, you know, you, if you look at Oregon's electoral map, it looks like a red state by geography. The vast majority of counties mm -hmm. went 70% for Trump. And then there's three blue dots along the I-5, Portland, Salem, Eugene. And that's where all, most of the people live. So that's why you have, you, you know, that's why it's a blue state. Um, I think what happened specifically last year was a kind of trial run. I think it was one of those things where uh, a sort of cartoonishly villainous administration was trying to figure out what it could get away with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, if, if given the chance, they will try again and they will continue pushing to see what they can get away with. Yeah. Um, they didn't get away with it so much in Portland, but they'll try again. Yeah. So Omar, before we go to our audience questions, um, I know we've been talking about some very heavy subject matter here uh, throughout the evening, but necessary to talk about because this is the world that we're living in. But in the midst of all of these things, this is a question I ask many of the people um, that we get to speak with here. Um, what gives you hope in the midst of all of this heaviness? On a personal level, I... Um... So the last few, last few years were hard. I think they were hard on everybody, obviously. For the specifics are different for everybody, particularly hard. And um, 
you know, I, I lead this very roller coaster life, you know, an author's life is some days the royalty check comes in and yay. And then some days you don't know what the hell is going on, you know, that, that kind of, thing. and um, one of the things that would happen is I had come back from, you know, an interview that went disastrously. I made an ass of myself or an interview that went really well. And I'm, I'm all proud of it. And it would not matter in the slightest. My, my, my four-year-old daughter would run up to me and give me a hug and be thrilled to see me and be only interested in playing tag and, and hide and seek. And, and at that level, um, and I don't just say that, you know, uh, I'm sure there's a parade of human beings who'd be like, my kids give me joy, yeah, sure. But, but I think that the, the, that idea of, of um, what personal relationships can do, what, what we can do for one another on a very small scale, I think is going to become more and more important as we start to see the load bearing beams of our, of our systems kind of shape. Mm, yeah. um, you know, on a larger level, um, art, I think, I think some of the art um, coming out of both my part of the world and, and this part of the world. And I say without hesitation, again, I criticize many parts of America, but I think what artists are doing right now mm -hmm. in the face of this is going to outlast whatever this is, whatever this ugliness is, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I've been, I've been, very much lifted up by that. But before we get to audience question, what's giving you joy? Oh, I, well, I think similar to what you said, uh, family. You know, there are certain things that remain the same. There are people who will love you no matter what, people who don't change with, you know, the weather or the day's news. And I think, you know, to your point that that's what we have to hang on to. You know, those things that remain when everything else is shaken, the things that remain that we have to hang on to, uh, the people that we survived COVID with and all of that. So uh, yeah, I think it comes down to, to family at the end of the day. Um, and I'm also curious when you mentioned art, is there is there something in particular, a particular work or piece of art that you had in mind when you were talking about how it, it really gives you hope and is extraordinary? There's been a couple of things. There's been um, some of my favorite writers have put out work at great personal expense. So I'm thinking of, of things like um, Basma Abdelaziz, an Egyptian author who wrote a book called The Q, uh, which was about a uh, fictional country, it's Egypt, uh, with a fictional government, the present one, after a fictional revolution, it's the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. She has to talk in code, but everybody understands what the code is. And she, so she wrote this novel um, that's just, it's, it's a beautiful piece of work and it's, and it's, mm. it reminds me of Kafka. It's a beautiful distillation of absurdity. And she's just written a new one called Here Are Where the Bodies Are. I think that's a rough English translation, but uh, that book caused the cops to go from bookstore to bookstore looking for it. And she's, it's unclear whether she'll be able to live in the country anymore. Wow. So you, you see these people, I mean, independent of the work, which I think is excellent, yeah. um, courage is contagious, I think. And, and so when you see someone doing something like that, um, a lot of indigenous authors, I mentioned uh, Leanne Berasamasaki Simpson, Cherie Demeline, are doing really just new work. Mm. Um, and, and in some cases, these books go on to do amazing. And, and you know, I'm sure the royalty checks were great, but for the most part, you're not doing it for that. You're, you know, it's, yeah. you spend years of your life on this work and it, and it barely makes a dent, but it's so good. Um, to see people doing that work gives me, gives me um, a small measure of courage that I try to leech off of. Yeah. So uh, we have a question here. I'll go to our audience questions now uh, from Larry. And this is a topic that we didn't get around to talking about. And he asks, how will humanity save itself from the ravages of climate change if it does not forsake its greed, anger, and ignorance and respectfully embrace each of the other 7.8 billion people as entitled to an equal share of Earth's resources? So I, I will... I will shamelessly regurgitate the things that much smarter people have told me as a journalist. Uh, I cover, I wrote a lot of climate change stories and I, I remember distinctly going down to um, Miami to talk with a climate scientist who's been, who'd been uh, sounding the alarm on climate change for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. And he'll go to any community group that'll have them, any, any talk, and, and he'll, he'll warn them about this. And what he does at every single one of these things is he brings a relief map of the area he's in with little overlays where he shows, this is what your town is gonna to look like with one meter of sea level rise. This is what it's gonna look like with two meters of sea level rise. And he told me that almost every single time at the end of, um, at the, end of the talk, somebody will come up to him and point to the map and say, oh, my house is gonna be okay. And he says, yeah, you live on a hill. You need a boat to get to the grocery store. You know? And so I think yes. 
my first part of that answer is, is you have to obliterate that kind of thinking. I think we have a real hard time thinking beyond 30 years in terms of time, because that's the length of a mortgage and thinking beyond mm -hmm. our own sort of picket fence, maybe our neighborhood, maybe our town. I think we have to obliterate that kind of thinking because what's happening geologically is happening in a blink of an eye, but in human terms, it's taking long enough that we can afford not to care about it, but we can't anymore. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I will say about that is the, the, the problem and the saving grace is that it's never going to be too late. You know, it, it is too late now to stop climate change from having an effect on this earth, but it's not too late to keep it from burying entire coastal towns. And one day it will become too late for that, but it won't become too late to, to, to mm -hmm. save billions of human beings from being displaced and so on and so forth. Where too late is always changing. And then there's never an end point unless the entire species disappears. So I don't want to think of it in terms of, oh, we missed, we missed the, the, the starting gun, we're done. Yeah. This thing is moving and, and it'll always be, there'll always be a chance to, to get away from the worst outcome it's just that the worst outcome is going to become increasingly worse over time. Yeah. Question uh, from Judith about uh, Syria. Uh, she asks, what does the education system look like in Syria? Is it possible uh, to get an education? And what's the situation for girls and women? Um, to the best of my knowledge, the education system in Syria is um, similar to, to other education systems in the Arab world in the sense that there are certain things you never talk about. I think the propaganda level within the Syrian education system, the Syrian anything system is, is higher by virtue of the dictatorship being bloodier and more sort of uh, orthodox. Um, typically speaking, it is much easier to get an education in um, what are considered apolitical things, science, engineering, you know, you want to go into those fields, you might be able to get a decent education. Um, it is, um, I was just talking actually recently to um, this young woman who just moved here from Syria. She, she came over at 12, a refugee from the war, and she's been here ever since. Hasn't seen her family in, I believe, a decade or something like that. And she was talking about this notion of, you know, when, when she's writing this book about her experience and, and she knows that everyone is going to lead with the war and lead with. And she says, well, well also, I didn't think I would ever get an education. Um, and, and so one of the reasons that she's very glad to get out is not just to get away from the war, but now she can study. Yeah. Um, that is in part tied to, the, to the, the systems of governance and the systems of education, but it's also tied culturally. There, there's certain cultural traditions, not just in Syria, but across the Arab world, um, where it's just less important for women to get an education. It's considered that way. And of course, that does the kind of damage to a society that you would expect, um, but it's very sort of culturally ingrained in certain traditions. I'm not saying that education is off limits to women in the Arab world. It certainly isn't, but there are certain cultural traditions in which it is not important. There are yeah. other things that women should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. And that's caused huge damage over, over decades. Question from Gabrielle who says, uh, I have heard that you were thinking about the Peter Pan fairy tale and you did mention that um, when writing this novel. Um, how does that story inform yours? Um, I, I will, Jorge Luis Borges, one of my favorite sort of thinkers about literature, um, once said that all literature is tricks. And at the end of the day, no matter how clever your tricks are, they, they have, they're eventually found out. Um, my tricks aren't particularly clever. Um, my, my, my central trick is inversion. Um, I take prevailing attitudes, prevailing ways that the world work. And I, I try to flip them on, on, their, on their heads. And in this case, I wanted to take a comforting fable that Westerners have been telling their kids for 100 years. And I wanted to invert it to tell a different kind of story. Mm -hmm. When we think of Peter Pan, generally today, we think of things like the Peter Pan syndrome, right? Where it's a grown man who won't stop acting like a boy. The origins of the fable when J.M. Barry wrote it are the opposite. The, his older brother died in a skating accident, I believe at 13 years old, and it crushed the family. His mom never recovered from it. And it was very much part of the impetus years later for him writing the Peter Pan fable. Mm -hmm. And so it's in fact an inversion. It's not about the man who won't stop acting like a child. It's about the child who never gets to become a man. Yeah. Um, and so that in the context of what I was writing seemed to fit as a container for, for the story I was trying to tell. Yeah. That said, if you didn't know that I was writing about Peter Pan and you picked up this book, um, 
there's a very good chance, unless you're really familiar with J.M. Barry's life story and the story of Peter Pan, there's a good chance you wouldn't see it anywhere. And the, the, at no point is it overt, I don't think. Yeah. Um, so it's very much sort of beneath the surface of the story in detail. Yeah. Um, Winnie says, wonderful discussion. Your phrasing is so memorable in the book and um, the writing so beautiful and moving. Would you talk about um, Mafuz's influence on your writing and did it also affect your prose articles? Uh, and then adds, thank you, can't wait to read the book. Thank you so much for that question. I, um, recently I was fortunate enough to write the introduction for a new translation of uh, Arabian Nights, uh, Al Falila uh, Ulila, Thousand and One Nights. And it's, it's a beautiful book uh, that I'm glad they're giving me the author copies of because it's also going to be really expensive. It's full color, you know, and so I can't afford it. So it's nice to get. Anyway, um, they, I was writing about um, my father when he was a kid. He lived in Al Hussein, which is one of the oldest neighborhoods in Cairo. And um, on Thursday nights, I believe it was, he would sneak into this coffee shop, Ahwat Al Fashawi. It's this thing that's been run by the Al Fashawi family for hundreds of years because the luminaries of Egyptian culture at the time, this was sort of 50s, 60s would show up and they would have these like battles of free verse and they would discuss the issues of the day. And at the center was Nagib Mahfouz. Nagib Mahfouz would hold court. Um, and so my first introduction to literature wasn't a story, a particular story, a particular book. It was my father telling me stories about Nagib Mahfouz. So Nagib Mahfouz has a lot of influence on me. His writing does, but also like meta influence. Uh, and one of the things that influences me the most is the story of uh, one of his books, which was uh, called uh, Wilad Haritna, which means um, Children of Our Alley. It was, this, it was not one of his more famous books. The famous books are the Cairo Trilogy. That's, that's probably what won him the Nobel Prize. But Children of Our Alley was the story of a bunch of alley kids in Egypt. But really, it was the story of the, the prophets of the major religions recast as stories of, of children. And a lot of people didn't catch on. And then he won the Nobel Prize and got way more attention and the Muslim Brotherhood found out what he had done. So suddenly this book that had lived in relative obscurity becomes the reason that one day as Nagib Mahfouz is walking down the street, this kid runs out and stabs him in the neck. Mm. And um, it almost cost Mahfouz's life. And in fact, he, he suffered with the effects of that for the rest of his life. Wow. But um, he also kept a correspondence with this kid from prison. He, and he found out later that the kid had never read the book. Uh, he had just been told that it was blasphemous and, and told that he should do something about it. And so I think about the cost of saying what you mean and, and the, the, the consequences, right? And so when I talk about couching stuff under other stuff and burying things in the text and whatever, yeah. do I necessarily need to do that? No, I, I'm fortunate to not have to worry about that to nearly the same extent, but it's something that's ingrained from reading not only the works of these folks, but but what the aftermath of the work. Yeah, there's something in there too about the uh, consequences of misinformation, it would seem, which we're seeing an awful lot of right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you go out and try to kill somebody, you at least read the book, right? Like it's just, <laughs> it's, anyway. At least know the story. At least know the story. <laughs> well, I have to, uh, before we say goodnight, I have to read the comment from Judith, who says, thank you so much for answering my question. She had asked a question earlier and says that she found this interview to be so interesting. I'm, yeah, my, it's a little bit blocked here. There's a little, little, there it is. Found this interview to be so interesting and enlightening. Um, Judith, thank you for that comment. And I'm sure that Judith um, speaks for our audience um, Omar, it has been such a pleasure and an honor to talk with you about this beautiful book that you've put into the world and uh, just to hear your perspective on the world in which we all find ourselves right now. So thank you so much for making time to be with us tonight. The honor was all mine. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, thanks to our audience for being with us and sharing your Thursday evening with us. And as always, I want to thank Laura Kovacs, who kicked us off tonight, as well as Jason Freeman and, of course, Andy Kay and the team at uh, Author Events at the Free Library. They're the ones who bring all of us together so often for these great discussions. So thanks to all of you. Omar, again, our, our great thanks to you for being with us. Continued success in all that you do. To everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and the summer. Be safe, and we'll see you next time.